Hello, my name is Martina Marti. I'm a theatre maker and diversity expert based in Helsinki. I have been living here for the past 13 years or something like that. Um, originally from Switzerland and um, have a university degree from England and then worked in, in Germany. So um, a kind of a nomadic life before I, I settled down in Finland and started working here as a, as a theatre director. And um, this is also the, the perspective from which I will be talking about, um, about diversity. So I came here to Finland as a, as a grown up, first of all, and I already had a university degree and was already uh, in working life, had in a way started my career. But uh, as an immigrant, I came into a country where I didn't speak the language and didn't yet have a network. So this, this is my perspective that, uh, that I'm speaking from. The topic of my lecture is how do diversity, equality and inclusion relate to art? The slide that I'm showing um, shows an illustration uh, with three um, uh, buildings, you could say. They are uh, kind of grey uh, uh, squares, uh, shapes. One of them could be a museum, one a theatre, one a concert hall maybe. And there's these um, small shapes that look a little bit like flower petals uh, that are arranged within those uh, houses in neat rows and then also around them in a more organic shape. I will return to this illustration here. I just put it for more decorative purposes. Uh, I already said in my introduction that I came as an immigrant to, to Finland um, already in, in my professional life, but without uh, language uh, knowledge. And I integrated into F Finnish society and into Finnish uh, language. I use this word integration uh, quite on purpose. Uh, we usually think that immigrants have to integrate into a society and already there I think it's actually a two-way process. The society also needs to integrate into a situation where there are different people with different backgrounds. But uh, later on I would also like to, to use this word in yet another way and propose a, a different meaning to it. Um, I'm saying this because I think it's important for you to know from which perspective I, I speak about diversity, but of course I, uh, in my lecture, also want to open up uh, different perspectives and different points of view um, and, and different experiences on, on diversity. These are the, the topics of my lecture. Uh, I will look at the concepts, diversity, um, equality, inclusion, what do they really mean? I think it's important for us to have a, a common understanding of what is meant by them. Uh, then, as I also mentioned, uh, this idea of integration, I would like to propose a new take on, on this concept, how, how to take diversity, equality and inclusion into consideration in our everyday lives um, on a personal level but certainly also on a professional level and then finally I would like uh, us to rethink art and the question is what does all of this have to do with art before I start um, I'd like to manage a little bit uh, your expectations uh, I have noticed uh, uh, giving these kind of uh, lectures and, and trainings um, that people are very eager to to learn about diversity and they want to do something differently and, and be more diverse and the expectation is, is often at, at very uh, eager and, and give give us the solutions and unfortunately this is not how it works it, it would be very nice if I could come with this golden tray and say here is all you need here are the tools, uh, take them and, and, uh, and then you'll be fine. Uh, it, it doesn't work like this. Working with diversity, equality, inclusion uh, requires all of us to go through a process. So each one of us has to do the work and it's uh, not very comfortable. It uh, requires us to go back into our past, into our childhood and revisit things that are very dear to us and, and acknowledge that we're all part of a, of a world that, uh, in which exclusion and discrimination exist. And it's, it's not very comfortable. It's not a very uh, 
um, easy process. I would like to encourage you to, to also think, okay, um, uh, Martina said diversity is this, but what does it mean in my context? What does it mean in my work, in what I am doing? And, and to find out what they, these things mean for you. And also what kind of words you require to work uh, in this field. So we need, uh, we need new words and we need a new understanding. And sometimes this is not very, uh, very easy and comfortable, but I, personally, I also find it very inspiring. On my next slide, there is this um, uh, illustration of a room. Uh, you see uh, paintings on the walls. Uh, there's uh, windows and a door, chairs. There's some plants. It's a little bit messy. One of the chairs has fallen over. Um, it could be a gallery or a museum or even a um, foyer of a theater or a concert hall. And uh, the th uh, thing that attracts our attention in this image is a, a big black something, a mass of something that we can't quite define. Uh, it's, uh, it's not completely black, it's a, a sort of kind of different shades of black and, and dark gray and it has little white, white dots. And this uh, image uh, shows for me very well what diversity is. <clears throat> diversity is everywhere. It's in our societies, it's in our museums, our schools, our homes, our streets. And we, we can see it, we, we notice it. Uh, it's everywhere. But we're not quite sure how to address it or how to deal with it or how to approach it. It's kind of this strange thing and we don't really have words to describe what it is or to, 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 to uh, address it. It's a little bit frightening. It is this black thing uh, where we're not quite sure is it um, what, what will it do to us. But at the same time, it's also actually quite beautiful and it's quite intriguing. Um, these little stars sparkling in, in the, uh, in, on this ba uh, dark background. So in a way, we also would like to know more about it. Uh, diversity means that every person has uh, certain qualities, uh, characteristics, backgrounds, or issues related to their identity. And they can have to do with gender, sexuality, socioeconomic status, age, physical characteristics, skin color, disability or illness, appearance, religion, language, cultural, ethnic background, political views, ideologies, beliefs. So all these things um, uh, are aspects that can shape a person's uh, identity People don't only belong to one group. It's a very dynamic thing. People's identities also change. So um, it's really, really broad. It's a very, very broad concept. And I think when we, uh, in our work, deal with diversity, it's, it's really important to be aware of all of these act aspects and to uh, remind ourselves time and again that, oh yes, it also means this and it also refers to that. And at the same time, when we then start to really concretely work uh, and want to make changes in, our, in, in what we are doing, then I think it's good to be specific and say, okay, today I am tackling this issue. Today, I would like to um, address uh, people who might feel uh, excluded because of this aspect, be it language or, or whatever. Um, what, what I would like to give you with this image is that diversity is a reality. It's already there. So we don't need to do anything to be more diverse. Um, it, it's, it's, the, the process is about how to find um, words and ways to address the diversity that is, that is around us. And like I said, uh, identities, people, everything is changing and it's a very dynamic world we're living in and, and every person is a whole universe. So after this uh, more philosophical introduction to diversity, I would like to uh, quickly look at the legal grounds on which we are moving. Uh, I have 
put just for decorative purposes a, a scale and a hammer to signify we're dealing with law here on, on the following three slides. Uh, first, uh, I uh, uh, added here um, an article from the Universal, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and it reads, everyone has the right freely to participate in the cultural life of the community, to enjoy the arts and to share in scientific advancements and its benefits. Everyone has the right to the protection of the moral and material interests resulting from any scientific, literary or artistic production of which he is the author. So this is very important. It means that participating in cultural life and the arts, as well as participating in production of artistic uh, uh, processes and, and production, uh, is a human right. I think this is very important to know. On the next slide, uh, I have a quote from the UNESCO Universal Declaration on Cultural Diversity. It reads, policies for the inclusion and participation of all citizens are guarantees of social cohesion, the vitality of civil society and peace. Thus defined, cultural pluralism gives policy expression to the reality of cultural diversity. Indissociable from a democratic framework, cultural pluralism is conducive to cultural exchange and to the flourishing of creative capacities that sustain public life. So here um, it says that cultural diversity is a reality and there should be policies uh, to not uh, make everyone the same, but to actually keep that, that uh, richness and uh, diversity as a resource uh, and to, to make, see that as a strength. Uh, and this will uh, lead to social cohesion and peace. So, so it's very, very important. So when we uh, face criticism, uh, we can actually also uh, uh, refer back to, to these um, articles. Uh, and in this uh, uh, context, I uh, recommend you all to look into what are the legal grounds in your own countries. Uh, in Finland, we have uh, in the constitution, uh, an article about equality, and we also have a non-discrimination act. And I'm sure in your countries, there will be similar legislation. And someone might say, oh, but you know, it's really a minority issue. And, and this is really not, not a part of our core activity. Then, then the argument is, well, actually, we don't have a choice. We don't have a choice. Do we want to deal with diversity and inclusion and equality? We have to. It says it in the law. Um, I would like to, uh, in the following slides, speak a little bit more about this term equality. What do we mean by this? In, uh, uh, on, on my next slide, you see an image of um, uh, three uh, flower pots. There's three flowers, sunflowers in pots, and they are uh, in a garden. So there's a garden uh, uh, fence and behind the fence, the, the sun is shining. The flower on the left side is the tallest and it reaches the edge of the fence and, and has access to the sunlight. But the other two flowers are too short. They stay behind the fence in the, in the shade. So uh, this is a kind of a, an unfair situation. Uh, I'm sure we would agree. And let's, let's think of what could be a possible solution to make it more equal. So in the next image, uh, uh, all the flowers have been given a little stool to raise them. Um, and you can see that now the flower in the middle also reaches the edge of the fence and has access to the sunlight. The tallest flower on the left uh, is yet taller and reaches even more above the fence. But the, the one on the, the, the flower on the right is, is still too short. So the stool didn't really improve the situation of this, this flower. But when you look at this uh, uh, scenario, you, you will probably agree this, this is fair, right? Uh, everyone gets the same treatment. All the flowers get the same little stool. It's fair. 
but still it's not quite equal. It's uh, not really satisfactory. So what could be another solution to this problem? How could we still uh, improve the situation? In the next image, the stool of the tallest flower has been taken away and given to the shortest flower. So now all the flowers are on the same level. All of them reach the edge of the fence and have access to the vital sunlight. This looks quite nice. Uh, it's important to know that this um, uh, treatment of the shortest sunflower is not discriminatory to the tallest flower. So the tallest flower does not suffer from the fact that the shortest flower has been given two stools. Um, very often we uh, use the term positive discrimination when we talk about situations like that. Um, but again, uh, it's just important to, to, to be aware that, uh, and there's actually also legal grounds in Finland, this is, for example, in this non-discriminatory act, it is uh, written very clearly that this kind of treatment is not seen as discrimination towards the, the tallest flower. So I think this, again, in our work is very important to understand that doing something to um, help uh, certain people who are excluded to have access to, let's say, um, uh, um, cultural um, services, they, that is not discriminative, discriminate, discriminative to the people who, who already have access. It's very important to understand. So this is, this is a situation that is maybe already quite often in place, at least it should be, because we have the legal grounds for it. But um, since we're here not just to talk about what already is and could be, uh, I would like to still use our imagination to go a little bit further. How could we improve this situation? Or how could we find a different solution to this problem? And here is the final image. The flowers have been taken out of their pots and they have been planted into the ground. So now they can really spread their roots and uh, firmly ground themselves in the earth. And also the fence has been taken away and they all have equal, equally access to, to the sunlight. And of course, we are not talking about flowers and sunlight. We're talking about uh, human beings and the, the sunlight could, could be culture and, and art, which we all need to flourish. I would like to continue speaking a little bit more about that fence that was taken away here in the last image. And on my next slide um, is the question, what is racism? This is usually a, a a uh, word that is a little bit uh, frightening, but I think it's important to also talk about this, um, this uh, term. I have a quote by the German playwright and dramaturg uh, Nechati Osiri, and he says, racism isn't the opinion of a certain person towards a certain group of people, but racism is a network or structure by which we build spaces, societies, and states. So really it's this fence that you could think uh, uh, in society and uh, everywhere there are, there might be these, these fences. And these fences very clearly say who can go some, into a space and who can't. And uh, when we work with inclusion, it's very, very important not only to, to think about the little stools that we could give for people to peek into our garden, to have access to the beautiful sun, but also to think where are um, these walls and uh, can we tear them uh, down? But what I would like to say uh, still about racism is that usually uh, when we talk about racism, we uh, assume that it relates to um, discriminatory, um, discriminatory, discriminatory um, behavior towards people of color. Uh, if you have not heard this term, it's uh, so, sometimes also um, uh, abbreviated as POC, POC, uh, people of color. So black people 
this term of racism to broaden it a little bit, that yes, this is a, a very, very big issue, uh, racism towards uh, POC people. And uh, if we as white people, or I as a white person have not access to this kind of experience, it's very important for me to acknowledge that it exists. It's very, very real. Um, and also racism is also directed at people who are not white enough. So in the context of a country like Finland, for example, uh, there is actually research showing that racism is very often directed at people who are in this sense not white enough. So um, Roma, Sami people, R Russians, maybe even Estonians. So th this racism is, is not always so direct and the walls that exist that this um, um, Osiri refers to when he says that racism is a system, they, they are not very visible. And I think it's important to become aware uh, of that and ask where do I have walls in the work that I, that I do? So uh, the next term that we will look at is inclusion. Uh, you might know this uh, wooden box, uh, it's uh, a toy for, for small children, it has holes in different shapes and the, the small toddler finds the block of wood that has the right shape to put into the right hole. And uh, the blocks that go into the box, they are very happy, uh, but there are some blocks that have a completely different shape and there's no fitting hole for them. And the blocks inside the box, they shout out, oh, I don't know what you have. You just have to be yourself to get in. But of course, if the, the, sh the hole is not the right shape, the child can try and put them in as long um, as they like. It does, just doesn't work. So the question is, can we create different openings? Can we imagine different kind of ways to open what it is we're doing, whether we're working in an institution or as um, uh, artists or whatever, uh, can we kind of try and, and think of ways to create openings that different kind of people, people who have not yet access to what we are doing, that they can also be part of that. Uh, so, our next uh, uh, topic, I will uh, come back now to this uh, idea of integration. How can we uh, take all of this that I have been sp uh, speaking about now, how can we take this into consideration in our everyday lives? How can we adapt that to what we are doing? And I'm using this model by Malik Gustafsson. It's a, a four steps of change. First, recognizing, then understanding. The third step is will for change. And the, only the final step is the making. And this process uh, from, from recognizing through the stages of understanding, will of change towards the making, this is what I like to call an integration, integrating a new kind of thinking and seeing the world into what we do. Um, so let's start with recognizing. Uh, first of all, we need to start uh, recognizing our own attitudes, privileges and prejudices. The way we see ourselves, our identity, says also something about how we see the world. So it's very important to understand that um, the world uh, might be very different to people who have a, a different identity. Where do my privileges come from? Privileges are very, very concrete. They give us a head start, they advance us, it's an advancement. So it means that certain people with privilege, certain privileges have, um, uh, are kind of at, um, ahead in others in having access to resources such as money or to healthcare, to education, to housing. It's a very, very concrete thing. Here on this slide, I put in brackets some exercises you can Google them and, and find out more about it and, and uh, um, maybe even do these exercises on your, on your own. One is called Privilege Walk. 
uh, this is difficult, difficult to do on your own, you will see, but, but you can maybe watch some videos of how does it work. And then there's a uh, privilege bingo. Uh, these are things that, that are quite a, uh, on a personal level. You don't necessarily need to share this with your work community. Um, uh, but I, I suggest this is that you look into this because this is part of this process that I mentioned when I showed you the golden tray uh, to be aware of, of where you stand and what your privileges are. Uh, this is not very comfortable to do. And this process might cause uh, feelings of shame or anger or sadness. And that's perfectly normal. That's, so when you feel these feelings, you know you're on the right track. Um, it, it is a, a difficult process, but it's very, very necessary. Then uh, there's some blind spots. There's always things that we are not aware of. Um, usually people surround themselves with people who are similar to themselves. So there's a lack of diversity in our close environment. And there's an exercise called circle of trust if you again want to do this on your own and find out how diverse your, your circle of trust is. Um, and there's ways of, of then dealing with this lack. But first you need to recognize, oh yeah, this is actually true. All my friends are a little bit like myself. And then also recognizing one's own power. Where do I have power? And, and, and to, to be aware of that. But yes, actually I do have power. The next step is on, uh, then called understanding. So recognizing these things doesn't all mean that we, we already understand. And I have put here some, some questions that can help you uh, tackle these, these things. So they're, they're more meant to, to start you thinking about these issues. Uh, so I read, how do attitudes and prejudice influence me and my actions subconsciously? What are my privileges based on? How does that uh, have an influence on what I do and how I behave in certain situations? Again, this is quite personal. Uh, personal process that you need to do. But then also the, the larger context. Uh, um, what is the context, the, the surroundings in which I am working? And the, the question that I put here is how is the history of my country or my context linked to the history of imperialism and colonialism? And um, this is a, a very important question, usually or often in, in uh, uh, in a Northern European context, we, we tend to think, oh, we, colonialism, well, we were not part of that. That's not really our history. And, uh, and uh, kind of, yeah, we, we don't really need to deal with it because we were not part of it. But actually, it's, it, this issue is much more, co more complex and the world has always been global and everything has always linked to everything. So, for example, in a Finnish context, um, um, there's different discourses. You might know that Finland was at one time part of Sweden, and some people might say that Sweden colonialized Finland. At the same time, however, Sweden had colonies in uh, North America, and there were Finnish people involved in that. And also Finland exported uh, tar, pine tar, which was used in ship manufacturing and was also used in making ships that were then later used to transport slaves. So this is a, a very clear connection to colonialism. Um, later on, Finland was part of Russia. Someone might say Russia colonialized Finland. I'm not sure this would, would uh, go with my definition of, of colonialism, but, but at the same time, Russia uh, colonialized indigenous peoples in Siberia and fin Finnish people were involved there as regional leaders or um, researchers and travelers. So it's a very complex, complex world. And from 1917, Finland has been in, uh, a nation state. So actually only from this moment on, we can ask has Finland as a state had colonies? And then, of course, we come very quickly to the question of the indigenous people of Finland, the Sami, and we, we know that uh, Finland um, co colonialized this indigenous people and tried to destroy uh, the culture and beliefs by taking away the, the, the children from the families and put them in schools in faraway places and forbidding them to speak their own language and also suppressing the religion and the, the uh, the rituals that it were involved uh, in, in the religion. 
and the exertion of the, the religion. So it's it's very, very complex. And this is just a small, small excursion. Um, but but I think it's important for us to, to be aware of this and to be aware of this, this uh, uh, complex issue. The next question that I put, how does nationalism shape our minds? And this kind of attacks the, what I have just been talking about, because uh, in my previous question, how is the history of my country, the history of my country, uh, that is a nationalist construct. Uh, construct. So uh, the coming up of nation states um, brought along the idea that there is something like a nation, the Finns, and they are in a certain, they have a certain characteristic and, and they are, in a certain way, which makes them finish, but this is this is constructed, and uh, it's but it still shapes very much our mind. It's still how we think the world that there are countries and nations, and it also affects art. What kind of art is is produced uh, in certain or, or what kind of um, exhibitions are made in in let's say a national museum or a national theatre. So it's, it's this idea of nationalism is, is very, very important in, especially in, in our context, maybe uh, alongside with the idea with the question of colonialism. And then also how is the history of art linked to the history of racism? <clears throat> Again, uh, a very discomfortable question, but the, every art form has a certain history which uh, tells us uh, how, by what criteria we, um, judge um, the quality of a certain art artwork and uh, where does this history lead us and what kind of um, yeah what is considered high art what is considered good art as opposed to folkloristic art or or uh, something that we even don't even know that it exists so and, and the, this, these mechanisms of exclusion um, art is also very exclusive in that way. So I think it's um, again very uncomfortable, but it's important to be aware of these, these, these issues. And then uh, the question of power again, how does power work and how and when do I use power? And then how can you bring that already a little bit closer again to, to what you're doing? So what are my surroundings and what local context do I operate? What minorities live here? What, what, does, what is the diversity here? In, 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 the, in the place where, where I'm working. Uh, my organization, if you work within, a, within an organization or with, in a working group or a community, what, what, um, how do we uh, define expertise or artistic excellence? And how, do, how and when do we exercise power? And in the work itself, who is spoken to by the content, the topics, the aesthetics and the chosen formats, who is addressed and who is not, who is invited and who is not. It's important to ask this because uh, sometimes it's quite clear that who can go somewhere and who not, even though we don't say it anywhere. Then we come to the third uh, level, uh, the will for change. And this has to do with motivation. So it's important for you to think, what is my personal motivation? Why do I want to work with this? And also to discuss this within your work communities. What is the motivation of our organization or our working group? Why do we want to work with this? And what are the benefits of doing that work? And now finally we come to the actual making. What can we make? And I have put here some, some just some ideas, but of course the list is much longer and it depends very much on what, uh, what you are working with and what you are doing. Uh, so this is just to spark some ideas. I put here recruitment and recruitment criteria. I think it's very important that we, that the workforces and people we work with uh, are more diverse. So we really need to review the criteria that we set for recruiting people and these processes. Then uh, the concept of art and what kind of a person is an art, artist. This I, I uh, briefly just talked about already. So what, what do we think art is? And what, how does a person look like who is, is an artist? Can we broaden that? Also, can we um, uh, make it possible to, to um, work with uh, different languages and different uh, sensors, so creating multilingual and multi-sensory experiences. 
And then we need new networks and new experts. We need to start working in different ways with different people and not only always with the same people in the same network, uh, the same way as we have always done. And it requires non-critical thinking. I haven't said anything about norms, but uh, they are predominant, unconscious, uh, invisible ways of understanding and seeing the world. And usually the thing with norms is that they become visible when someone is breaking them. So we need to start becoming aware of what are the norms also within our art forms and to, to be critical about that and to question, question those norms. Uh, so before now, I just talked about uh, concrete things that where, where one could start making a difference. Uh, but again, it depends so much on what you are doing. In, in this slide, I have put some things that are always important when, when you're working with diversity. And uh, uh, the first one is the importance of listening. So acknowledging that we don't know everything. I don't know everything. I don't know what it feels like to be a different person. So I need to, I need to listen. I need to ask and, and listen and to acknowledge that I don't know. The importance of dialogue. So we, we can't do this on our own. We need to talk to uh, each other and to, to, to different groups of people. Mistakes will always happen. Uh, the important thing is to learn from them. And in that sense, it's really important to always evaluate what you're doing and to ask for feedback and to, to not be afraid to, to get negative feedback because that's actually what will, will uh, bring you further. Uh, I think this process is, again, also personal. So what can you do on a personal level? Um, because I was talking earlier about the circle of trust that people surround themselves with, with people who are similar to them. So maybe also there that, that uh, when you recognize that you can start become maybe more open when you meet a, a different person, a person who's very different to you. But also you can, uh, you can learn about the experience of different kind of people through literature, for example. So to kind of um, also do this work on a, on a, per, on a personal level. Okay, so to our final topic, rethinking art. What does all of this have to do with art? I maybe already a little bit touched upon it, but let's, let's take a closer look um, at this question. So here I have an illustration uh, with uh, three images. On top is uh, uh, an image of maybe an amphitheater, like in an antique uh, Greek theater with an auditorium and the stage. And there's again these um, flower petals uh, that signify people and the, the, uh, in the audience. And then there's some in, on, on the stage. Uh, then there's a, a, we see a seated person. Uh, uh, we recognize it as a man, he's turned his back towards us, he's in an armchair and he's looking out into the universe, the, the black universe with the stars, and he holds a cigarette in his hand and um, uh, contemplates uh, what, what he sees. And then the final uh, image uh, is, um, uh, is um, plant-like uh, shapes uh, on a black uh, background and a torchlight that uh, um, uh, highlights some of these, these plants. So these um, images, um, with these, I would like to start to think a little bit about um, concepts that we have of art. So I already mentioned that each art form has a history and this amphitheater reminds us that yes, there's the antique Greek theater and this tradition of performance and, and what it's, what that means and how the, the audience behaves in this situation and what happens on the stage and the, the concept of a well-written play and all that, this, this tradition that we build on. And this is, this is very deeply rooted in our understanding of, of theatre or performance and what can, that can do and what that should do. 
uh, also that this, this man who turns the back towards us, the, the genius, the artist as a genius, as a kind of mystical person who we don't quite understand how this artistic process, the process of creation, innovation happens in his head and, and how he understands and interprets the world, the universe that he sees and, and contemplates. So this kind of uh, mystification of the artist genius and and the torchlight highlighting the plants and the classifying what we do in museums we put things into orders and we name them and tag them and and uh, create classic um, categories so there's very strong uh concept of of what a theater is what art is what a museum does um, what is high art and i think it's very important to start questioning that, that actually an artist can be a very, very different person. Uh, the artistic process can be very, very different for, for, for different people and in different contexts. And it's important to understand that art, uh, the, the concept of art is independent and universal, that that's just a myth. Um, art is always cultural, uh, culturally specific and it is rooted in a specific culture and history and locality so that uh, the artistic expression that is deeply cultural to one person can at the same be time be totally foreign to another person. There is no such thing as universal art, it's just that some art forms are dominant uh, and in some other art forms, the widespread understanding and expertise of these art forms is completely lacking. So uh, we, we, we need to be aware of this kind of imbalance. Uh, and we need to be open towards different artistic expressions that might not necessarily fit into these images. And also this question of artistic freedom. Uh, often uh, we hear that, well, artists should be free to, to do whatever and to, to let, let the flow of artistic expression happen freely. But um, I would like to counter to this by asking whose freedom are we talking about? Because like we have just seen in, in our walk uh, towards change, uh, that we all need to recognize where we stand in the world and there are imbalances of privilege and there are racist structures in the world so who whose freedom are we talking about now i return to the box of the toddler with the holes in different shapes like I said earlier, we need to try and make different holes for different shapes to fit in different blocks of wood. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I also think that we can never foresee the vastness of diversity. So no matter how many different openings we make, there will always be someone who doesn't fit in. So I would like at this point to ask, could we imagine, uh, instead of making openings, could we imagine actually opening up what we are doing, our institutions, our work processes in a, in a more radical way. And this is uh, uh, kind of um, expressed in the next illustration. So the wooden box uh, has now been opened up, the walls of the box have been folded open. And now within the box, there's a, a kind of pyramid or a tower of blocks that are in very, very different shapes and they are actually much taller than, than the box. So how can we open, open up um, what we are doing? It's, uh, it means that we need to be open to something we don't know yet. When we do open up, we can't foresee what will happen. And I think this is actually the, the interesting thing and the inspiring thing when we are working with, with inclusion that we are not quite sure what will happen. And this is, uh, at least for me, is also a, a great motivation, uh, the kind of excitement, what will happen? Uh, someone will tell me a completely new uh, definition of art. And, and I think this is, this is interesting. So I return to the very first illustration. I uh, already said that there are uh, three um, forms that uh, refer to arts institutions, uh, a theater, a museum, a concert hall maybe. 
and uh, there's these uh, flower petals again. Within the uh, institutions, uh, our museum, Theatre and Concert Hall, there are neatly in rows. There, there are different shape, shades of light gray to dark, uh, almost black. So uh, there is some diversity there, but, but they are all neatly in, in rows. So it's kind of uh, within the theater and the museum, there's always, you always do the thing the same way. It's kind of, we know how we do it. But outside, uh, around these um, uh, buildings, the flower petals are in very different shapes. They are very differently arranged. It's more an organic form and it's actually quite beautiful. So the diversity is out there, but how can we bring it into um, the, the buildings, into the institutions, and not just the institutions, also wh whatever you're doing into your, your way of working with people, with your way of uh, creating art or um, uh, uh, exhibiting art. And this brings me to, to the next image. It's a close up now of one of these uh, buildings, maybe the museum. And now, uh, again, some of the, the flower petals are still in, in uh, rows. But in the middle, they have actually started to form a different shape and uh, they're very in a very different order. It's, it's more organic. And again, it looks a bit like a flower and it's quite beautiful. So how can we uh, allow within the framework of what we are doing, allow a change towards more creativity, more organic, um, a different way of, of doing things, of seeing things? How can we integrate that into what we think uh, a museum is or a theatre is, and, and in that way uh, expand our notion of what it is that we are doing. This brings me to the end of my presentation. I have um, uh, put some links here for you. Um, there's some materials on a website called Culture for All, also the illustrations um, by Alexandra Burda that I, I was using today. Um, uh, are uh, part of this material. There's uh, a lot of material also in English, so uh, please uh, feel free to, to check these links out. And then also a um, uh, link to a video, uh, a talk by Chimamanda Adichie, uh, just for, for some inspiration, a uh, very good um, uh, perspective on uh, the single story. So the, the need for different perspectives. Yes. Yes, it's a very good question. I think this um, <clears throat> steps to, towards change. It's actually very, very practical. It, it should be very practical. Um, uh, but when you ask me how how is it happening and where is it happening in institutions? I actually have a, a, another uh, kind of ladder and that's the, the level of diversity within organizations. It's a person called Eva Rönke who, who made this, this um, and I will just briefly tell you what it is. So uh, um, it's the question of, of uh, how much uh, or how the, the organization is dealing with, with diversity. And on the first level is um, the resistance to, to diversity. So it's not part of us, uh, of, of what we do. It doesn't concern us. And uh, yeah, we, we don't deal with it. Uh, the second level is that they are um, promoting diversity uh, just as much as is, is required by law. So a lot of institutions are on this level. They're just doing what is necessary. Um, but it's not really, uh, th there's not really a policy for, for a diversity or a dialogue or the question, like I was also in my lecture saying, you need to find out what does diversity mean for you? The next level is exploiting diversity. So their organization have, has understood, ah, oh, we can benefit from diversity. A good example is a customer service. We have a museum and we noticed that there's a lot of uh, uh, Russian speakers, for example, coming to our museum or people who dress differently. And so we want them to have some 
um, uh, point of reference in the people they see working in the in the museum. So they hire people who who speak different languages, maybe a person who wears a hijab, uh, and and in that way kind of try to look um, diverse or be diverse, and also um, uh, have this point of, of reference for, for the visitors. Um, and in, in a sense, they exploit diversity, they, they benefit from it. But it's not part of what they're doing. It's not that the, 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 the workforce is deciding who, what, what is exhibited is diverse. And I mean, this is already the third step. So this is already, there's already some diversity and some kind of awareness. Oh, actually, the world outside is diverse. And we kind of, yeah, we kind of want to, to be part of this. But then not only the final step is, the, uh, is where diversity is integrated, like the, the way I use the word integration. So integrating diversity into what the institution is doing and trying to learn from it and, and seeing it as a resource and trying to do things differently and finding new networks, new experts. But the actual integration of diversity, it may be happening with certain projects or, or in, in certain uh, initiatives, but it's, it's, it's really, really hard to get onto this, this final level. The, the kind of, um, and to go back to this question of recognizing, understanding, will of change, making, where, where is it? I think it really starts with the recognizing that people or, or maybe maybe trying to to too quickly go to the making and yeah we do a project and and, and that but it, it needs to start with this that we recognize all all these issues and then start to understand and think why do we want to do this to have the motivation so so it's it's a very concrete process but i i personally from my experience it's very slow and it needs a lot of um, ac uh, activity and, and uh, pushing from, from individuals who, who are within their organizations or outside and, and push. And of course, also activism, um, like this, this movement, uh, Black Lives Matter, they, they bring this issue really into the discourse and, and it makes the institutions aware that ah, we need to react to that. So these, these things are, are, are unfortunately still very, very needed, uh, uh, you know, to, to, to bring the awareness.